Aloha and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living. I'm back from vacation and looking forward to an exciting show today uh, regarding foreclosures in Hawaii. I want to remind everybody that about 37% of our population lives in an association and the purpose of this show is to help owners and board members alike understand the obligations of living in an association. If you're following us and have a question, you're welcome to dial our hotline at 415-871-2474 and we'll do our best to answer it. Some of you may have read in the paper recently that there have been several class action lawsuits filed locally by uh, local attorneys against current condo attorneys here in Hawaii, alleging that they violated the foreclosure law and seeking large penalties for violating the law. So I asked a good friend of mine, Kapano Kiakona, to come down, who's a lawyer here locally, to talk about these class action lawsuits and uh, what the effect may be and what the issues may be. So welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. It's well, good to be here. Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself personally? Um, I'm born and raised here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, actually born and raised in Kailua. I still live on the windward side. I grew up, went to Kalaheo High School. I went away for school, came back right after. I've been doing condo law for at least a decade now and I've been enjoying it. <laughs> Well, you haven't aged much in kind of law. You know? you know, I tell everybody I listen to whining all day, so I do red whining all night when I when I think about the condo world. This is a tough business to be candid with you. You know, and how about the firm you work for? What do they do, and how uh, big are they? Uh, we're Porter McGuire, Kiyokona, and Chow. We have uh, thirteen attorneys, and we primarily focus on condo association law. We do some commercial litigation, some family law, um, and what we do is. Uh, we make it our point to assist boards and assist the association in doing their job a lot easier. Would it be fair to say and that um, when you look at association law in Hawaii, because you have 13 lawyers, you're probably the largest firm in Hawaii? I think we're up there. I think we're one of the larger. Um, you certainly are one of the largest firms yeah. in Hawaii. And certainly I've worked with your firm quite a bit as well as the other firms. And, and I would say you're very good at what you do and well, you're very you. helpful to uh, clients and boards and homeowners alike understanding their obligations. Before I begin on this class action suit, maybe just a little bit of housekeeping. Tell us the difference between a judicial and non-judicial foreclosure. Certainly. Um, judicial foreclosure, as the name implies, it goes through the judicial process. That means it's overseen by the court. Um, you file a complaint with the court. You file motions with the court. Um, they appoint a commissioner to go through the sale itself. And there's a motion to confirm the sale. It's a long process and it can get quite expensive. Uh, Non-judicial foreclosure is outside the court system. It's handled by the attorneys. Uh, there is a set place on each island in each district where the foreclosure auction is to take place. Uh, here, the non-judicial foreclosures happen right in front of the Queen Liliokalani statute by the state capitol. Now, taking just judicial foreclosures for a second, and just approximate, briefly, how long does it take and how much? The, the cost can range, and it depends on whether you're able to serve the person or not. There are various uh, requirements on that. But you're talking about cost at least eight to $10,000 to do a judicial foreclosure. And from beginning to end, how long? Uh, from beginning to end, again, that's, that's a range. But it normally, at its earliest, I've seen, I've seen them happen with the lenders. I've seen one done in eight months, but that was an anomaly. It, it has often taken years to years. complete, yes. And how about non-judicial foreclosure? What's that cost versus the timing? Non-judicial foreclosure, the, the large cost will be in your publication costs. That's where a significant amount of money comes from. Uh, but it can be done around for $4,000, $4,000, $5,000. And how fast? Um, from the point where it's given to the attorney, you can have something done within six months. Now, the difference between the two in some respects, when you do a non-judicial foreclosure, you're really getting possession. You're not really assuming the lender's obligations or the property taxes for an association. They're really getting possession, I guess, theoretically, so they can rent it out to help mitigate their loss of uh, maintenance fees. Correct. The, the objective for the association is 
mainly to get people to pay, but um, if they take possession of the property, then their goal is to rent it out, recoup their costs, and eventually the lender will step in. Yeah, and so they're not paying that mortgage or, or absorbing the liability of having that mortgage. They just have gotten possession and they're going to rent it out to try to help cover the lost maintenance fee income, for lack of a better word. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I've always explained that to people as if four people went to dinner and you get the bill for the dinner at the end and only three of you have the money to pay for it. The restaurant's not saying, well, I'm only going to charge you for three people. I'm going to charge you for all four. And the three have to come up with the money to pay the difference. And very much like a condo, if you have 100 units and one person doesn't pay, their budget's based on everybody paying. So the remainder owners who are in good standing have to pay the deficit of an owner. And that's why it's important they foreclose promptly if, if they can't make a, a deal with, a, uh, uh, with an owner to catch up or make some kind of program. Because I think it's very important that they foreclose promptly and if they don't have someone who's willing to step forward and, and make a plan, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And I would add to that, I mean, if you look at it, it from the overall association perspective as well. What we've seen in some of our, our associations is owners talk. So they know that there's no consequence to not paying your maintenance fees. And so there are some unscrupulous owners out there who will refuse to pay their maintenance fees because they see there's no consequence to their neighbor for doing the same. And we're gonna get more detail on this later, but just start the show by saying, give us a summary of what these class action lawsuits are saying. What are they alleging is being done wrong? Where, where do they feel there's a problem within the current statute? So the problem they're, they're arguing about is for an old statute. The statute changed in uh, May of 2011. So what they're arguing about is the statute as it existed prior to May of 2011. And what they're claiming is, is that under that statute, there were two parts. The first part was uh, 667, five through, I wanna say 10 and then 667, uh, around 22 to 43 or something. So you have part one and part two. Their allegation is, is that associations were foreclosing under part one and they weren't allowed to foreclose under part one. They're claiming that associations were only allowed to foreclose under part two. And what is the difference between part one and part two? Um, part one is what the lenders were using. Part two had this weird provision that required after you had done the foreclosure that the foreclosed upon owner would have to sign the conveyance deed. So basically you foreclosed on an owner and they have to agree to that foreclosure. And so it make it almost, why do it if that's the case, right? Certainly, I don't know of anyone that was able to foreclose under part two. And when they amended the law in 2011, did they fix that part of it? Is that what they did? Um, when they amended the law in 2011, they really kind of revamped things. So it made an overall change to both part one and part two. So it, it was a full um, alteration. I don't know if you recall, they had a, a foreclosure commission uh, that, that went through and it actually put the brakes on non-judicial foreclosures for, I want to say approximately a year. Wow. Yeah. So let's just kind of back up a little bit and talk about, in simple terms, the foreclosure process under non-judicial foreclosures, it begins with the association, usually the management company, giving what I call a 30, 60, 90 day warning. I don't look at those as fair debt letters as much as like late fee notices, more kind of notices before the legal process begins. And mm -hmm. so my experience is most management companies or boards after 60, more likely 90 days, are saying we haven't heard from you in three months. Uh, they turn it over to their attorney. And yes. so what do you do then? Um, we get it, we review the, um, the ledger, make sure, we check the addresses, and we send a demand letter. That demand letter expires in 30 days. If uh, we don't hear back from them, they file, we file a lien against the uh, property. Once that lien is completed, we'll send another demand letter, let them know, hey, we're gonna move forward if we don't hear back from you and if you don't pay. Um, when that, if they don't pay, do a notice of non-judicial notice of default and intent to foreclose and then you actually have at the front of the queen lily okalani statue i think you said or wherever it was that uh you then hold an auction 
There's actually one more step after the notice of default and intent to foreclose presently. What happens is, is once the notice of default and intent to foreclose is, is submitted, there is a 60-day cure period. Within that time, they can ask for a payment plan, things like that. Once that 60 days runs up, then you have a notice of non-judicial foreclosure. Is it fair to say that any owner who's delinquent who unfortunately has this process initiated against them has been given adequate several notices. It, it, this doesn't happen by surprise, you know, that they've been giving lots of notice and lots of opportunity to address the matter with the board or its attorney. Certainly, most of the owners um, <clears throat> receive the notice. If they're saying they didn't, it's because they've skipped town a lot of times. Uh, we use whatever information they've provided the, both the managing agent and the Department of Taxation, their property taxes. Um, so we do what we can to make sure they get notice. It's, it's always better for them to pay and keep people in their places. And I would assume if the owner had died, let's say, for example, it's probably then goes to probate court or some other, there's not some automatic foreclosure process that where you have a deceased person that, uh, that you can, uh, it, it must slow down a little bit to give them a fair opportunity to uh, address that matter. Well, I'm going to give you the lawyer answer here, right? It depends. Because <laughs> depending on how the, uh, how the property is owned, it right. may pass automatically to someone else. Right. Right. But if the sole owner was deceased, then there would be... But the important issues. message is that owners are notified, so a delinquent owner, it's not a surprise to them that all of a sudden, how did this happen? I've, I've read people in the paper say, I don't know, I came home and they were evicting me. I didn't know this was happening. Unlikely. Very unlikely. Very unlikely. Um, especially considering notice is posted on the door of the foreclosure. Is it fair to also say that if you're an owner and you have a problem, the best thing is to get with the board and address it and try to find a way to solve it before, because under the statute, these legal fees are going to be assessed against them. And if, if they're already having trouble paying their maintenance fees, more legal fees is not going to help them. Is it best to say that if you have a problem and, because uh, most boards that I know don't want the property back. They'd rather have a paying owner and have a payment plan, reasonable payment plan, that uh, before they would take this action. And the more you ignore it, you kind of force yourself into this legal proceeding, which is making the debt worthy, worse. And so it's better that they go ahead and they try to, uh, to uh, meet with the board or, or, or discuss this uh, with them. Absolutely, absolutely. And most of, a vast majority of the associations give a 12-month payment plan. So you've got 12 months to pay off the delinquency. I think that's in the statute, right? That an owner has an automatic right of a 12-month payment plan but I think that requires them also to stay current with their, with their existing maintenance fees. So you could take your delinquency and you could then add that, but divide that by 12 plus your current maintenance fees. And by law, the board would have to grant that to you. Correct. And I would just say from experience, I know where there's been problems and I certainly have empathy for homeowners who have gotten some surprise, maybe it's illness or death or loss of job. They don't want to lose their home and, and boards don't really want that. I've seen even some boards give longer payment plans to try to give people a chance to keep it, but where they take action is when they get no reply and people just ignore it because they're afraid of the consequences. So I would just say in general terms, it's, uh, it's better to, to do that. It's, it's better to stay in contact and, and, and please keep current on your payment plan. The boards tend to have some, some empathy for people but if you're on your third shot at a payment plan, the, the board's going to have some trouble with that because they have their fiduciary duty to their other owners. Well, this is fascinating. I've got a lot more questions, but we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in one minute to talk more about foreclosures in Hawaii. Aloha. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays. 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker. 
and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. We highlight success stories in Hawaii of both businesses and individuals. We learn their secrets to success, which is always valuable. I hope to see you on our next show. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're here talking with Kapono Kiakona about the recent class action lawsuits filed in Hawaii against attorneys alleging that they violated the current statute in their collection process for non-judicial foreclosures. And we're talking about how that whole system works and, and about that lawsuit. We kind of ended up with a discussion about the importance of owners if in fact they have a delinquency to reach out to their board and try to find a way to solve this because these fees mount up a lot of times because owners just ignore the demand letters and because they don't have an immediate solution or they're afraid of the consequences don't reply to all these legal letters and all of a sudden uh, they're in foreclosure with a greater debt because of the legal fees and what uh, not to put words in Capone's mouth but uh, we were saying that it's highly unlikely if not impossible for owners to be foreclosed upon without a lot of notice. This isn't a surprise to an owner where all of a sudden they get a notice on a Friday and the foreclosure is on Saturday. There's lots of statutory obligations with regard to this. That is fair enough, yes. So let me see if I understand this class action lawsuit a little bit. So you have an owner who's delinquent. They've been given lots of notice from the management company, lots of notice from the lawyer, you filed a lien, you're given notice of the foreclosure auction. Under the statute, they have a right to a payment plan up to 12 months. And so you have a delinquent person who hasn't paid his bills, and now they're trying to say the attorney somehow violated something, so you have to pay the bill. Basically. Um, it, it's even more uh, simplified and directed, I think. Their main contention is that the associations weren't allowed to foreclose under that part of the statute that they were using, that they had to use this other part that required someone to sign the conveyance deed. And how much, what are they looking for as far as, what, what is the claim, is there, is there a dollar amount or an estimated amount or what, because what, the class action suits that are representing in theory a whole unknown group of people of, of hundreds probably. I. <coughs> I haven't seen any specific demand yet on the numbers. All I did was read the newspaper, and I believe they threw out a multi-million dollar number for that. Um, yeah, I think it was tens of millions yes. of dollars, you know. <laughs> so who would, if, where would that money go if they, if they got any? Uh, well, with a lot of class actions, a lot goes to the attorneys, um, as you'll find. Um, I don't know. I think it's an interesting con. Uh, consideration especially when you look at a lot of the foreclosures that the association did happened right before the the lender foreclosures com were completed so you have these situations where you look at it and you say okay well what are your damages because you hadn't been paying your mortgage for the last three years and how are you gonna say that you were harmed by the association action right so. I mean, I can, I can see this, but, uh, you know, they're arguing, to me, they're arguing on a technicality. And, um, and uh, I have a hard time personally understanding, are, are they trying to get their property back? Is that one of the claims? Were they, uh, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. It, the claim is purely for monetary damages. They're saying they were harmed by the association moving forward with their foreclosure, exercising the statutory right of the association to foreclose. But was the association harmed because they didn't pay their bills? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We had, uh, when we took over for, for some, they had huge delinquencies of people because people weren't paying. And what it was is, if you recall that time frame, it was sort of the leftovers from the housing crisis. Um, people had walked away from homes, and that was the problem many associations had to deal with. We had a project on Maui, which was, uh, I think, 67 units. And mostly second homes, they may have used it for a vacation rental, but all legally and legitimately as far as the zoning and what they were at. But we had a third of the owners after 2008 
simply walk away from their property, which means they weren't paying the lender nor they were paying the association. And if you can imagine the impact on an association of a third of your owners stopping their payments and how that affects funding reserves, how that affects just meeting the basic obligations to run the basic bills of electricity and pay them. So that particular association had to do a special assessment on a monthly basis for the deficit in cash flow lost by delinquent owners. And their hope was, as they got through this non-judicial foreclosure process, because as you said earlier, that's quicker than the foreclosure process of a lender, that they could get possession, at least mitigate that loss through renting it out, which seems only reasonable and fair to me. Um, you know, uh, it's hard for me to imagine how you can argue that if you didn't do your job and pay your share, how you can say I'm harmed because of some technicality that exists with respect to the uh, um, this alleged foreclosure law. And that's what a lot of the, a lot of people they have that empathy for the owners and they forget that the people that are paying regularly like your project on Maui, they have these huge unexpected bills because other people aren't carrying their load. And all of a sudden, you're left with the, the association, the board, the other owners are left with the idea of, okay, well, what do we do? What do we need to do? How do we get these funds back? And foreclosure is a necessity. I think non-judicial foreclosure has been recognized by the, by the, uh, by the legislature as a very important agreement to give fast opportunity to get possession of the property. Again, they're not responsible for the mortgage, they're not responsible for the property taxes, but they're able to rent it out and get some cash flow. Oftentimes the rental income exceeds the maintenance fees and they're allowed to then keep the difference, which helps mitigate the loss of cash flow. And of course, when a commissioner is appointed under the regular foreclosure, then that all changes. But it's, it's a method to try to help restore the financial viability of an association. Absolutely, and the legislator, when they change the law, they recognize that. And because we only have a few more minutes left on the show, have there been any court hearings on this so far and what's happened with that? There, there are numerous cases filed on this, um, some class actions, some just single owners. Uh, there has been a hearing on a motion to dismiss filed on behalf of one of the law firms. And that hearing was before the land court judge, Judge Chang, and Judge Chang granted that motion. They dismissed it. Said He said, look, the association has the right to foreclose under the part of the statute that they were using. And so there's no claim against the attorneys for that. Uh, we are hopeful that the other courts will follow along with that. There are motions pending in other courts, and we'll see how those come up. The, one, the foreclosure... The class action lawsuit, I believe, is set for January with the motion to dismiss. So basically the attorneys have filed either motions to dismiss or motions for summary judgment saying this is not correct, your interpretation of the statute. So they just want the judge to rule on a basis of the law that they had the right to do it. And so far Judge Chang on their first case to come forward ruled in favor of the attorneys by dismissing the lawsuit. And I think he did for the most part that with prejudice. Yes. Can you tell the, to our audience the difference between with prejudice and without prejudice? Certainly. If something's dismissed with prejudice, it means it cannot be brought again by that person. If it's without prejudice, they have the opportunity to change whatever defects there were in their complaint and file again. So that's a pretty solid statement. Yes, yes. Now, is that probable or likely or maybe uh, under the rules they, they can't do this. Will other judges know of Judge Chang's ruling? I mean, like the federal judges and the other judges in state court that may have similar claims? Um, they're likely to know about it. They're not bound by it, but they're likely to know about it. And um, we hope that they will follow his ruling. And as I said, Judge Chang is the judge that handles the land court appeal, so he handles these types of things regularly. He's seen it before, he's familiar with the statute, and so it's something that we trust he made the right call, and we trust that other judges will see that. And do federal judges typically know what state judges have ruled and, and their deliberations? I mean, I'm not saying they're bound by it, but do they usually typically know other actions that have been taken place? As part of um, disclosures in federal court, you will list other uh, cases that are similar that, that deal with the, that are somewhat related. And so they should know about 
this ruling. So it sounds like, from the first case anyway, this case is going to have a, a short life. These cases may have a short life. We don't know how judges are going to rule, and every case may have some difference in facts. But the reality of the part two and whether the condos have the right, at least the first adjudication sides with the attorneys that they, they follow the right process under the statute. Correct, correct. Now, is your firm still doing non-judicial foreclosures? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the thing to remember is these lawsuits are only challenging foreclosures that were started before May of 2011. So anything that happened after May of 2011 was done under a different law. So they, the arguments that they raised are inapplicable. Yeah, I can, I can see that. And frankly, there's a degree of equity in this is that here you have a non-paying owner who's been giving all this notice and still didn't make any arrangements and refused to pay. And then all of a sudden he lost his unit to no surprise. He should have known. Meanwhile, had similar problems maybe with his lender. Um, and now he's saying, no, you have to pay me. There seems to be a, an equity in that concept to me, but, you know. <laughs> it is unfair. It is unfair to current owners. That's the thing. It, it's unfair to those owners that paid. So if you were a board of directors, what advice would you have for them? Would you tell them that continue to collect money and do non-judicial foreclosures? I mean, it seems to me not having the income is very harmful to the association. Absolutely, absolutely. They, they shouldn't let this uh, s stop them what they're doing. They, the non-judicial foreclosures are appropriate under law and they should go forward. They have a fiduciary duty to collect the maintenance fees. And when they stop doing this, that's when they get in trouble. Well, this has been a very interesting show today. And I think the message is that there have been some class action lawsuits filed and we've hope we've helped explain to you what the issues are uh, before an association. But uh, remember this, boards are fiduciaries. They need to have the money come in. And based on their discussions with their attorney and what the facts are of a case, they need to continue to represent their board well and make sure that owners pay their obligations, in my opinion, uh, under the current statute. Next week, we have another exciting show, Condo Insiders, every Thursday from 3 to 3.30. We hope you enjoy our content, and we look forward to seeing you then. Aloha.